live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the inside scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Good evening. Welcome to the inside scoop. I'm your host, Lindsay Davis Stover. I'm thrilled to have with me this evening Jessica Foster, who is a delegate for, uh, a, sorry, a candidate for state delegate of the 88th district. Jessica, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thanks for having me, Lindsay. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for having the courage to put your name on the ballot. Can you talk to us a little bit about what motivated you to run for office? Sure. Well, I think it was a culmination of things that, that really led me here. One, with the really bad federal policies that were happening over the last, path, the last couple of years. But then I learned that it was my delegate that had been blocking the Equal Rights Amendment for the past 10 years, and I felt like I, I had to do something about that. And tell us a little bit about your experience. What has prepared you uh, to run for delegate and ultimately be the delegate in this district? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm an attorney. I'm a litigation attorney. I practice primarily criminal law, um, representing mostly juveniles. So I'm in juvenile court most of the time. About 95% of my practice is in juvenile court. Um, folks come to me, they have an issue, uh, and, I, and I have to help them resolve that one way or another by reaching out to the other side and, uh, and trying to, essentially, it's, it's problem solving and representing clients both in, in court and out of court. And I think that essentially that's what we expect from our electeds, is that they represent our interests in Richmond. So this was just taking it to the next level. Well, tell us a little bit about the 88th District. We have viewers from all across Virginia. What areas does the 88th District cover? So the 88th District is the three southernmost precincts of Fauquier County, down 17, a portion of Stafford, half of the city of Fredericksburg, and um, eight precincts in Spotsylvania County. That's great. So is yeah. there something unique or that you love most about your district? Um, I love the city of Fredericksburg. The city of Fredericksburg is just this gem. Um, but the, the district is, is, is very much different in, in different parts. So the three southernmost most precincts of Fauquier County um, make, up almost all of, uh, make up almost the majority of the land of the district, but it's only 9% of the voters. And then you come into Stafford, um, so I have a portion of Stafford, and then I have only half of the city of Fredericksburg and several precincts in Spotsylvania County. So it's really different. The needs of Spotsylvania and the city of Fredericksburg are very different, and then the needs of the city of Fredericksburg is also very different to what is needed in Fauquier County. And it sounds like with your experience in law um, that you will have the ability to represent many communities of interest in, in your district. I, I certainly think so. I mean, I, my, my experience, I've been on the front lines of the juvenile justice system, criminal justice system for the past 10 years, and I've come across people of very diverse backgrounds. Um, particularly when I'm, you know, when I'm working with the, with the indigent clients in juvenile court, or because I do take a lot of uh, court-appointed representation, so the court appoints me to uh, certain indigent clients, and I represent them. And but I also can can be retained by by folks who who want to come in and hire me to do work for them, either in family law or represent their children in, in juvenile court. So definitely folks from all walks of life. That's great. Now tell us a little bit about what you think is at stake in this particular election? Well, I mean, this is a really important election. One, because we have every single seat in the House of Delegates and in the Senate that's up for grabs. But we are so close this year in, in gaining the majority in both chambers. We're two seats down in each, and that's really what's at stake. Uh, because ultimately, next year, we're going to have the census in 2020. And what follows the census is the drawing of the district lines. So we're talking our, our House districts, our state, uh, state Senate districts, and our, also our congressional districts. We want to make sure that we have the people that, that are representing us that support an independent redistricting committee so that we can take the, um, essentially, we can allow our, the people to vote for their representatives. They're the ones who get to select their representatives instead of the other way around. That is, that, and that's huge. But something that we don't often think about also is that the Virginia elections affect the entire country. One, the Equal Rights Amendment, we could have passed last session. That would have given, that would have enshrined uh, equal rights, sex, essentially sex discrimination in the Constitution for 160 plus million women and, and uh, girls nationwide. But also Virginia's gun laws. Virginia's gun laws affect 
the whole nation because it is one of the easiest it's one of the easiest states to purchase guns mm -hmm. and uh, criminals come to Virginia to buy their firearms. Wow, so I know we've touched a little bit on three very important issues uh, when it comes to the independence of making sure our maps are drawn in which people can choose their representatives versus the other way around. Right. We've talked about the gun laws. Um, tell us a little bit more about the issues that you want to champion. I know the ERA is very important to you as well. Yeah. When you're down in Richmond, what is going to be your priority? So my number one priority, um, being a juvenile defense attorney, is investing in children, investing in their education so that, I mean, because ultimately the ch our children are our foundation, right? And we need, to, we need to make sure that we're investing in them, investing in education, investing in teachers. And when, I'm, when I talk about that, I don't necessarily mean just teacher pay. Teacher pay is important. But we need to give the teachers the tools that they need to do their jobs properly, which is man manageable classroom sizes. Um, modern infrastructure, support staff, mental health counselors, so that they can teach, but they also ha now have the bandwidth to identify at-risk youth. Uh, and that's, that has a direct impact on, on what I do and, uh, and the cr juvenile justice system and our, and our criminal justice system. Because when we're talking about at-risk youth, we're talking about not necessarily kids who are going to be, who have the potential of being delinquent, because mm -hmm. delinquency ultimately is just a, it's just a symptom of a much larger problem. Uh, we're talking about children who may be hungry, who are bullied, who may be victimized at home, um, or who may have, who, who may have uh, special needs. And, and right now, if a, if a teacher has a, a classroom size that's too large and no support staff and no mental health counselors in the school, uh, they don't have the bandwidth to be able to identify these kids and get them the help that they need before it becomes a real problem. Mm -hmm. And then these kids end up in my office or in the courtroom. So one of my main priorities is keeping our kids in the classrooms and out of the courtrooms by investing in education. Uh, second to that, of course, I, I mean, not in necessarily in, in order, but our children really can't, um, they can't thrive if their families are in distress. Mm -hmm. We have to invest in our working families and we have to make sure that they have that they are secure in their jobs, with uh, with strong you know strong union support, strong workers uh, benefits and protections, strong um, so strong pay, mm -hmm. and uh, and also protect them from the medical side as well. You know, protecting protecting uh, pre-existing conditions and keeping kids on their parents' insurance until they're 26, preventing pharmaceutical companies from being able to price gouge life the price of life-saving medication like insulin and epinephrine. Uh, and we can do a lot better when it comes to building transparency for, for providers as well. You know, getting that $20,000 bill with yes. no breakdown is, uh, is, is something that we can really, we can change here in Virginia with, uh, with that. So. Well, that's great. I love that you're talking about such serious and important issues like mental health, and especially in our schools. It is an area that I think, you know, we've neglected for so long. So thank you for championing that particular issue. Uh, because it is such an important issue. And you mentioned about supporting working families, and mm -hmm. I know that you have been endorsed by uh, many groups that really support the workforce, uh, and you have a sure. lot of incredible uh, endorsements. Can you talk a little bit about those endorsements and what they mean to you personally and what they mean to your campaign? Sure. Well, I've been endorsed by a number of unions, um, Firefighters Union, mm -hmm. um, Carpenters, uh, Layuna, a number of unions, a number of unions, primarily because I, I really want to invest in in working families. Um, you know, increasing increasing the um, the salary protections and family protections and and uh, leave family family medical yes. leave, which is really important. Um, I'm a small business owner, so I understand the difficulties of what it's like to be a boss and to not be able to provide good health insurance coverage to my employees or being able to, uh, to, to give them the leave that, that, that I, I really believe that they should be entitled to mm -hmm. because we don't catch any breaks as, as employers. Um, so definitely investing in our, in our families. But I've also been endorsed by Justice Forward, which is, a, which is an up and coming um, uh, a group that was founded in Northern Virginia and their primary focus is on criminal justice reform here in Virginia. And that was one of the first endorsements that I was that that I got because of because I've been so committed to um, to our juveniles, the juvenile justice system, 
and, uh, and criminal justice reform. That's incredible. Uh, I've also been endorsed by um, by the um, I'm a Gunson's candidate, mm -hmm. so it's not an endorsement per se by Moms Demand Action, but they've definitely supported some of the things that I've talked about with respect to gun safety. It's their stamp of approval, I it's guess. It's their stamp of approval. That's, That's great. Right. Yeah, well, exactly. good. That's an important stamp yeah. to have. Right. And I know right now you are working like crazy to make phone calls, knock on doors. Yeah. Uh, really just be engaged in the community that you love, that you work in, that you live in. Tell me a little bit about what you're hearing from people. What, what keeps constituents in your district up at night? Um, more now than before mm -hmm. is, the, is gun safety. Yeah. I mean, when I'm calling people particularly, uh, yeah, that is, that's, that's one of the things that they want to talk about is what are we going to do in Virginia? about protecting our children and protecting our communities. And uh, so I, I, I talk to them about, about the things that we can do um, and the things that most people support, which is universal background checks, mm -hmm. extreme risk protective orders. Um, these are one of the two, the two um, pieces of legislation that I would absolutely uh, sponsor, champion, you name it. I'm 100% behind universal background checks. I don't think that anybody should be able to go out and, and buy a gun in a parking lot. And um, and also the extreme risk protective orders, I, I, I believe that that is a law enforcement safety issue uh, as, as well as a community and uh, a community safety issue. So, and, and there's a way that we can do that while protecting our, uh, you know, the Second Amendment. And we can do it with due process and, you know, keep everything, <laughs> keep yes. everything the way it's supposed to be. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, when you're elected, how often and how will you engage with your constituents to make sure that they really are a part of your policy making? Well, I think once you're elected, you, you uh, so there's there's kind of like this difference between camp being campaigning and being an elected. And I don't, I, I think that the campaigning really has to continue mm -hmm. because as as we're campaigning, what we're doing is we're engaging with our voters, um, we're engaging them on social media, we're engaging them in forums and town halls, and I think we need to continue doing that as electeds um, to remain visible, remain connected to our community, and remain accessible. The accessibility piece is really important to me. Um, that's that's how. I run my business, and that's how I would, uh, and that's how I intend to uh, to be as a delegate. Right. Well, tell a little bit about where folks can go to learn more about you and your campaign, whether they live in your district or outside of your district. Can you tell us where your website is and where sure. they can go to learn more? So my website is jessfoster.org, and there's many ways to volunteer. Um, by we can sign up for to go canvassing, door knocking do postcards, text messages, Good. Um, you well, name thank it. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Please Thanks stay so with us. Nice going, Spencer. I can't believe we broke old man Hennessy's window. Correction, dude, you broke. I just threw the ball. This is really bad. What are we going to do? We? we? Go to the door and ask for the ball back. Are you serious? It's my ball, Myrtlebeck. You're so dead. I'd run away. Yeah, to Uruguay. Kiss your life goodbye. Sorry. Let's go. Hey. See you, see you. Yeah. You're mean. You're well. Nice Some friends you are. Keep smiling. Keep shining. Hi. Hi. Tell him it was an accident, and we can fix the window. Come on. I'll come with you. Loyalty. Pass it on. You go first. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. One day these rats were playing in the woods. One of some matches and that's no good. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about me. That's right. Nothing very nice. I'm a homeless man. So if a gorgeous force is what you desire, don't and prevent wildfires. Fire. Awkward. I'm the awkward silence. You try to avoid me, then there I am again. But an awkward silence can be a great thing. Like Kelly here is about to demonstrate. You haven't really been yourself lately. Are you okay? 
Find out how you can help a friend with their mental health at SeizeTheAwkward.org. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Lindsay Davis Stover, and I'm so excited to have with me tonight Delegate Ibrahim Sumaira. Thank you so much for being with us this Thanks evening. Thanks for having me, Lindsay. It's great to, to be with you great tonight. Great to be with you too. Well, you have recently, let's just dive right into it. <laughs> You've recently made national news by sure. protesting the president at Jamestown. And for our viewers that may have missed that news cycle, can you tell us a little bit about what you did and why that was so important to you and, and to ultimately your constituents. Sure. Glad to be on the Inside Scoop again. Thank you. Uh, it all started when we found out that Trump was coming to Jamestown, which was a surprise. Uh, I think it, the idea was we were going to have a normal uh, celebratory event of 400 years of a much flawed uh, representative democracy. Uh, in the state of Virginia, and uh, to celebrate for what it's worth, to mm -hmm. talk about the, the fallacies, and uh, to hope for, for a better uh, future, right. uh, to talk about the sort of the policies that have uh, caused uh, harm for people, but also the good policies that have enabled the Virginia that exists mm -hmm. today. Uh, and uh, we, we thought in my team that it was ridiculous that a president who uh, has been attacking uh, people of all backgrounds uh, for just being who they are, uh, particularly people of color, mm -hmm. uh, to come to this event uh, and to use it as uh, a way to clean up their image. Uh, similarly uh, to the way uh, the 4th of July celebration was handled uh, for this year. Right. And during the president's speech, talk a little bit about how you did protest. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we came in pretty prepared. Good. Uh, you know, after finding out that the president was, was going to come along and uh, try to do some uh, some campaigning mm -hmm. at this event, uh, we we decided to make sure that uh, the message was loud and clear that his hate is not welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, so I designed a few uh, signs, mm -hmm. uh, stuck them together with uh, some tape, uh, laminated the signs. Uh, put on some uh, some very important information that I thought uh, the country should know. Um, that you know, in reality, the person who should really go back to their home is is Donald Trump, uh, and his uh, very corrupted uh, uh, Trump Tower in New York, which is a, a site of many scandals uh, for America's uh, politics today. Uh, the second sign was saying, "Deport hate." in reference to his policies on the southern border where he's regularly uh, uh, trying to uh, force people who are fleeing all sorts of hardships in pursuit of opportunity, in pursuit of uh, safety uh, on the southern border, uh, that instead we should actually be deporting the hate that the president has been espousing. Uh, and the last one was in reference to my own family, which has been impacted by poor immigration policies by the federal government. My father in particular, who has not been allowed re-entry into the United States, uh, uh, for many years uh, because of legal hurdles uh, that the federal government places on, on people of, of marginalized backgrounds uh, mm -hmm. coming into the U.S. And uh, we, we went in uh, 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 thinking that it was going to be a, a big deal and so we prepared ourselves for it. Uh, and uh, I, I came in hiding uh, the, the poster so that uh, the security doesn't, doesn't uh, see it and uh, uh, it's quite funny. I must say, you know, hiding in the, in, in, the, in the back of my uh, uh, my suit. Your suit uh, jacket, uh, your suit sure. Jack, right sure. in front of the suit jacket, and, and uh, at one point I was almost going to slip out wow. while I was walking through, and uh, uh, I acted like my back was hurting, and, <laughs> and I sat down and, and tried to readjust, and you know, it all worked out at the end, and got in and made the statement loud and clear to the commander in chief. That's great, so, and I'm I'm interested, and I know our viewers would be interested too. What type of response? Yeah. did you get after that? I'm sure it could have been a mix of negative and positive. Can you talk a little bit about the response you got and, yeah. and how that's impacted you? Well, there was a lot of discussion about what it is to have decorum sure. uh, in, in uh, the General Assembly. Uh, 
-hmm. And uh, to me, that decorum was broken by the presence of uh, this, this president who is essentially a racist. And uh, I, I was not going to allow that to happen. And so uh, the Republican Party saw it a little differently. Senate Majority Leader uh, uh, Tommy Norman called me an ill-advised bastard. Wow. Uh, as a response to me saying um, to the president, Mr. President, hmm. you can't send us back. Virginia is my home. Mm -hmm. That's all I said. So I'm, apparently I'm an ill-advised bastard for saying that. Uh, the uh, 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 speaker, Cox, said I uh, broke the rules of the House. Uh, and he was referencing a specific rule where basically, uh, you know, disturbing the peace. Mm. Now, speaking of an assembly body that was uh, put together by uh, people who were um, massacring natives all around them in right. 1619, um, and speaking of, uh, you know, an assembly that has been host to uh, much more craziness and disturbances of peace, uh, namely a shutdown of a gun. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, reform session, gun law reform session right. in 90 minutes. Right. Uh, the real uh, break of peace there, uh, uh, it, it made no sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how they thought that that was okay to, mm -hmm. to even say. Uh, and then furthermore, uh, they went and started fundraising off of it, um, uh, saying all sorts of racist things because of essentially my background for who I am, for mm -hmm. just being Palestinian. Uh, dissent and uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, tension there and, mm -hmm. and the press caught on to it and of course they uncovered it but uh, you know it, it still uh, it still stings that sure. uh, you know they think that I'm uh, less Virginian than they are. Mm. Well how does that fuel you? Um, does it embolden you to stand up even more for the people you represent? How do, how do you fuel that? Uh, you know at the end of the day it's all about policy work. Mm -hmm. It's all about empowering people of all backgrounds, trying to help them, trying to uh, lift them up in all different ways, whether it be from their uh, uh, health, from their public health overall, from a, a grandeur perspective, but also just from like economic empowerment uh, mm -hmm. perspective. And uh, you know, it, it, it makes me think about all the policies that I want to push. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I go right back uh, at it. You know, thinking about what it takes to. Uh, reduce systemic discrimination, reduce systemic racism. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to me, the answer is, is clear, um, focusing on what is the best bang for the buck in mm -hmm. terms of spending on everyday citizens right. uh, in the state of Virginia to, uh, from the government's aspect of, of empowering their citizenry. Mm -hmm. uh, mental health uh, is a big angle. Uh, 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 raising minimum wage right. uh, also has been proven to tremendously uh, increase the livelihood of people. Mm -hmm. uh, recent studies said uh, uh, focusing on reducing pharmaceutical costs, uh, uh, focusing on, on increasing mental health counselors at schools. I mean, these are the ways that we're going to protect our, our most vulnerable mm -hmm. and build a society that uh, enables us to succeed long into the future for under the next hundred years of Virginia's life. Right. I love during your campaign too because you spoke very openly about student loan debt, mm. which is not something that many candidates talk about. But yet, mm. when you talk to young people around the Commonwealth, it's one thing they fear the most mm -hmm. or one thing they're struggling with mm -hmm. the most. Mm -hmm. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how you're able to connect uh, with young people on that particular issue because of the importance? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a good profession. Mm -hmm. uh, I did collect half a million dollars in debt. Uh, but being a dentist, I do have enough econ economic empowerment to proceed in the, the professional world and, and make a good income and, and do my best to, to hit back against those high debts. Uh, but there's a lot of people that don't uh, mm -hmm. have that opportunity at all. And those are a lot of my friends. Mm -hmm. um, people that are still at entry level jobs, even after uh, going to college right. uh, uh, and graduating from college for many years, seven, eight years. Uh, it, it's a tremendous problem. Uh, that I think that uh, gets missed by a lot of our, our uh, uh, more successful generations in America. Uh, and uh, it's a hindrance. It, it controls a, the ability of somebody to, uh, to move up an economic ladder, to start a family, to uh, uh, reduce a uh, burden on their families. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people still living at home with their parents with degrees um, and with full-time jobs. And, uh, you know, they still have to, they have to pay off their debt. They have a high uh, monthly uh, payment, uh, but also they, uh, 
don't have the means of, of uh, finding uh, a way out of that problem. Uh, and uh, the interest rates are extremely high. They keep right. collecting. So you know, these, these are people that are going to continue to pay high debt, mm -hmm. uh, high, high payments for the rest of their lives. Right. Well, we have talked a lot about Virginia elections. Tell us from your perspective, what's at stake this year? Sure. What's at stake? Why is it important for people to get to the polls this year? Uh, <laughs> we're, this is the first time a, a, a southern state yeah. will have a majority uh, of Democrats mm -hmm. uh, that stand for progressive issues uh, in the Senate, in the House, and in the governorship. And uh, we will be able to push a lot of bills and, and uh, issues that have been held back for too many years to count. Uh, we're talking about passing the ERA, we're talking about uh, uh, increasing funding for schools, we're talking about uh, uh, increasing protections for those that are on the margins of society of all backgrounds. Uh, we're talking about uplifting Virginia to not just be the best economic Mm -hmm. uh, uh, economically empowered state in the country, but the best place uh, to live, the best place to right. thrive, the best place to, to have a family, uh, to balance out that formula uh, so that uh, we can set a model for the rest of the country, uh, become the Silicon Valley of the East Coast. Uh, we have so much at stake th uh, that requires uh, expertise, uh, that requires uh, true representative democracy, uh, and that's not what we have right now, and we need to change that. Uh, and furthermore, we're going to be setting uh, uh, the tone uh, for the 2020 elections. We're the uh, first election, uh, the last election before uh, the 2020 elections uh, as across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we can set the tone that you know we're coming out strong with policy, we're coming out uh, with a voice of reasoning, uh, um, with with the one that encompasses everybody mm -hmm. across the board. Uh, we will be able to come, uh, overcome a lot of the challenges that uh, we've developed over the past few years since uh, Donald Trump got elected. That's fantastic. You know, that's something, too, we don't talk a lot about, but Virginia does set the tone uh, okay. for so much. We set it after Trump was elected, and we'll set it before this next election. Sure will. You represent the 86th district, mm -hmm. but I will say you represent so many of us, <laughs> both in and outside of your district. The day you stood up, uh, you stood up for those that didn't have a voice, and I just want to thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Um, can you tell people what your website is? So if yeah. they want to learn more about you, want to learn how to get involved uh, with your efforts? Yeah, well, I'm all over social media. Uh, so find me on Twitter, uh, Ibrahim Samira, as my name is, is written, on Facebook as well. Uh, but my website is also Samira, the number four delegate, uh, as it's correctly uh, uh, spelled, dot com. Thank you for being with us. We'll be right back. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it. It's a big responsibility. Oh, it's huge. I know, it's huge. You know, and it's the huge. salary. Oh my god, yes. Right? I mean, like, I was literally, I was about to move in with my parents, and <laughs> right before, yeah, so this saved me. I, I really believe in you, you know? Thank you. It's nice to hear that from 
for money. <laughs> These are cool. Did you, um, what did you? We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Lindsay Davis Stover, and I'm excited to have with me this evening Carl Frisch, who's running for Fairfax County School Board. That's right. Carl, thanks for being with us. Welcome. You're in my district right now. Yes, That's fantastic. Right. So tell us, tell the viewers a little bit about your district, where your district encompasses. So Providence District includes Tyson's, it includes Mosaic, Oakton, um, you know, parts of Falls Church that are not in the city. Same with the Vienna portions that are not in town of Vienna. So there's quite a bit. It's it's a sprawling district. That's fantastic. And I know you well enough to know that not only will you represent that district, but you'll represent all residents of, of Fairfax County. If you elected. have to when you're on the school board. You know, there are, you know, there's two high schools that are physically located in Providence District, but there are high schools, there are 10 high schools that students that live in Providence District attend. So all of the school board members have to be able to work together because we're all in it together. You know, we have 35 elementary schools, 20 some middle schools and, and 10 high schools to deal with where our students are attending. So it's, a, it's quite a task. That's great. So you are running for school board. First, thank you uh, <laughs> for putting your name on the ballot. It takes a lot of courage to Thanks. do that. Can you tell us a little bit about what led you to the decision to run for office? Well, I like to say that my partner Evan and I have 150 kids in Fairfax County Public Schools. He's a teacher. Yes. So, you know, just by the fact that I love a teacher, I hear every day what's happening in our schools. Um, and those challenges and those problems and those successes um, become your own as well. Um, so when we first started dating, I would hear about his friends that were not leaving the profession but they were moving to other districts to make more money, mm -hmm. or they were moving out of Fairfax County so that they could save money on, on rent or, or buying a cheaper house. Um, so certainly those issues impacted my thinking. Um, several years ago, when the school district first really started tackling issues of LGBTQ equality, mm -hmm. I went to my first school board meeting, and I saw things being said in that meeting, and heard, heard things being said in that meeting that just are not appropriate for any kind of government uh, function. Kids were crying with the things that were being said, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and I, I knew that that was not appropriate. I knew that the voices that were being uh, echoed there were not the voices of people in Fairfax County, not the people that I know. Right. Um, and so I got involved and uh, the next time those issues came up, the mood in the room was significantly different. Fairfax County is a very welcoming place. People come here for our schools, but they come here because we're richly diverse in a lot of different ways. That's why businesses come here. Um, they come here for our schools as well. So we need to make sure that our schools are doing everything they can to protect our kids. And so one of the reasons that I decided to do this was that as well. Uh, and climate's very important to me as well. So um, I think that we can tackle these challenges um, and I'm excited to be in this campaign. I'm more excited to actually do the work than the actual campaign. I understand. <laughs> I understand. Now you've already touched on some of the, the topics that are going to be your priority. Tell us a little bit more about the issues that you're going to champion when you are elected. Well, you know, there are some major concerns mm -hmm. that I think are common for everybody. Uh, certainly class size uh, and trailers. Yes. You know, we're, we're down to 750 trailers, which sounds, it is a lot, mm -hmm. but it is an improvement. We were over 800 not too long ago. So we need to continue to make progress there. We can do that by um, shortening the construction cycle. Right now, if your school is being remodeled right now, it's gonna be 37 years until it gets touched again in any meaningful way. Wow. 37 years. Um, and so we need to do a better job of shortening that lifespan to about 25, 20 years. Mm. Um, and uh, we need to do a better job of making sure that uh, our students have access to the different programs and opportunities that uh, our school district provides them. So for example, in Providence District, the Falls Church Pyramid has not a single advanced academic program for elementary school students. Mm. So if you are one of those kids who needs to be in advanced academics, you're hopping on the bus, your parents are driving you across town. Right. Um, it's just not fair. You know, what do they think when they go to Little League or soccer 
and they hear about their friends having advanced academics in their own school. Right. Uh, you know, that they're less than. Mm -hmm. So we've got those uh, issues. You know, there's not a single language immersion program in Providence District, a richly diverse district like Providence. Wow. So I'd like to bring those things, and those can also help um, with uh, capacity issues, mm -hmm. um, depending on where you locate the schools. For example, Mosby Woods Elementary School, mm -hmm. which is in my neighborhood, uh, is over capacity. It's also uh, a level four advanced academic program, so it's drawing kids from all over the community, not just from its core community. So if we can do a better job of making advanced academics available to more students uh, across the county, we'll be able to even out some of those issues as well. You know, what I love about your priorities is that you're putting our children first. They that's really are your priority, and that's what I love about the issues that you're gonna champion. And, and you too, we've talked a lot about this, about the trailers. It has been a hot topic in yeah. Fairfax County. We had uh, a news article written not too long ago about the amount of trailers coming into the county. I know my daughter alone is in elementary school is gonna be her third year in a trailer. And, and from a parent's perspective, there are a lot of health and safety right. concerns um, in that regard. So I, I love that you're tackling that issue because uh, those are the issues that parents are talking about around the dinner table. And the fact that you're prioritizing our kids, I know you're in it for the, the When right you go reasons. door knocking, you hear about safety issues mm -hmm. and safety concerns. You know, we're investing a significant amount of resources to make sure that our schools are safe. We're building vestibules at different schools across the county. Um, and when we're, you know, building new schools or renovating our schools, we're making sure that they're situated in such a way that it's, it's more safe for students. But the trailers are the number one problem that I have on that issue is that they're not, uh, you know, we keep them as safe as we can, sure. but they are, they are not as safe as being inside of the school facility itself. So we need to do everything we can to reduce the number um, and that we do a better job when we are renovating uh, of considering uh, growth. You know, it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world when you're renovating a school and that renovation is going to take a seven year cycle from planning to completion to, to get the number exactly right. But we need to do everything we can to empower our facilities department to make sure that they have the resources that they can get as close to the mark as possible. That's fantastic. You know, because you have put children at the center of your priority, how will you include young people and students and children in your policy making? How will you engage with them once you're elected? I'm here because somebody engaged me when I was a high school student. Um, I was a quiet kid who did not talk much and I joined basically speech and debate a program called YMCA Youth and Government, mm -hmm. uh, model legislature and court program. I learned about bill writing and uh, what it, you know, how a bill becomes a law and what it takes to you know, run for office uh, as, a, as a high school student. Um, and that's what turned me on to the power of government to help people. Um, we need to do a good job of not only um, involving young kids in our campaigns, you know, they love to know that they can get extra credit by volunteering That's right. usually, <laughs> but we also need to make sure that we're instilling in them when we teach civics, uh, you know, the importance of being involved and engaged in this system. We have a student member on our school board, mm -hmm. which is pretty unique in terms of our government experience. Uh, we could do a better job of not only having that student involved, but expanding their role to bring other students into the system as well so that they can have a hands-on approach and see what the school board actually does. That's great. And, you know, one thing that I want to touch on, um, especially for viewers that are with us this evening that haven't had the chance to meet you yet, uh, can you talk about how your experience um, really prepared you to run for office but to ultimately serve in this position? I've spent the last many years being a public policy advocate in Washington. Uh, the last two years particularly particularly tough with the current administration, you know, driving into the city each day and seeing the alerts popping up on my phone. Um, but you get really creative when you're in an environment like that. Um, you're looking for po uh, policy solutions to just about everything. I worked particularly on consumer financial issues mm -hmm. and higher ed debt issues. So um, it's complicated. But when you can find solutions, there's great progress that can be made. I look at what's happening in the Department of Education right now around uh, public service loan forgiveness, mm -hmm. something that teachers absolutely rely on. And our teachers are the best investment we make in our kids. So making sure that they have access to 
student loans and the ability to pay off those student loans so there's not an albatross around their neck is extremely important to me. So we've been able to hold Betsy DeVos accountable at the Department of Education because they were not administering that program properly. Um, so I'm always on the lookout of how you can put equity into action. You know, if you consider the way that policy impacts everybody, mm -hmm. then when you actually think through what you're going to do, um, you're going to be more mindful of the intended impacts and the unintended impacts uh, and how those might uh, benefit or hurt people. Well, I know just seeing on social media and out in the community, you have been incredibly active and engaged, knocking doors, making phone calls. Uh, is there a particular story or someone that you've met that's really touched you uh, that you kind of carry with you as, as you finish through this, uh, this election? There's so many. I mean, mm -hmm. I've heard from parents who are sick and tired of their kids being stuck in trailers all day long. Yeah. I've heard from special education parents, uh, particularly after the restraint and seclusion stories came out. Right. You know, to them it was not news, right? right? To a lot of them, um, it was an opportunity to broaden the discussion. We have so much work to regain the trust of our special education parents. Um, so hearing their stories in particular uh, have been uh, very powerful. Um, but also hearing directly from students about what it's like to be in school today uh, and what they feel the biggest challenges are. Um, we work them to the bone uh, to help them get ahead. Um, and that partnership needs to, to be more balanced. We need to find ways to make it a little bit easier for them so that they're not as stressed uh, about their future. Give them plenty of opportunity to see what they can do with their lives um, and also make it a little bit easier for them in terms of what their workload is. Um, because as much as we like to talk about what it was like when we were there, <laughs> right, it's right. different now. Sure. And technology has forever changed it. Um, we, you know, it's not just the school experience anymore, it's all the other stress factors as well. So phone, screen time, et cetera. Right. Um, take those things into consideration. Well, and you're right. The intensity and stress level right now that our students are carrying every day is something that we probably haven't addressed enough as a community and a county. And, and um, I think that's fantastic that you're touching on that. Well, and I think you talked to most parents. It's one of the key issues is we, we need more counselors. Mm -hmm. We need more student-centered support services. Right. We need to dis destigmatize uh, the mental health issues that our students face so that they're not afraid of talking about it. Um, so that they're not afraid of narking on a friend when they know that they're having a uh, significant problem. You know, Woodson High School is uh, one of the schools that a lot of Providence kids mm -hmm. go to. And they had a number of uh, suicides over, mm -hmm. over a short period of time. And that's the result, uh, that's a result that we can't let happen again. That's right. Now tell our viewers real quickly uh, what your website is. They can go to it and learn more about They've you. They've seen my name on the screen, it's just carlfrisch.com. It's also Carl Frisch on every social platform you can imagine. Fantastic. Carl, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be right back. So I just moved in with this family, and it's embarrassing. The little one, he likes to go outside and crawl around in the giant litter box. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I was born, and I knew how to use the litter box. Look at that. That's disgusting. Oh, poop already. You're making me nervous. Oh, okay, I can't look at this anymore. I really hope he grows out of this, for his sake. So, how was work? It was 1,300 hours. My math class from 302 was in the trenches. Davy Roth had it the worst. Fractions were coming at him left and right. He just didn't get the damn things. Two days ago, I tried to teach him what one-fourth of one-half was using different sizes of blocks. Yesterday, I tried again by dividing up pizza. Both missions failed. Oh, no. But today, I was ready. I created a combat math game where the only way to beat the enemy is to outfraction them. Davy conquered every last denominator. My game was so successful, mm. the principal is deploying it to math squadrons all over the school. Anywho, how was your day? Oh, uh, today my boss treated the office to salad wraps. Hmm, <laughs> salad wraps. No. 150 over 90. 180 over 111. 160 over 110. I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. 
You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from invisible or silent. If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Lindsay Davis Stover. And our final segment tonight, I'm here with a good friend, Kenny Bodie, who is running for supervisor in Prince William County. Kenny, thanks so much for being with us. Lindsay, thank you so much. Thanks to FPA and for Inside Scoop for having me. Well, it's a, it's really a thrill to have you here today. And I'm excited to talk about your district. Um, tell us, the viewers, we have viewers from all over Virginia. Uh, tell us a little bit about the district and uh, maybe one of the things you love about it the most. Sure, so thank you, Lindsay, for that question. So the Occoquan District goes from the town of Occoquan itself, obviously the namesake of the, of the district, and it goes all the way through Potomac Mills Mall, through the Lake Ridge area, goes almost all the way to the Manassas City line. So it's a pretty big district. It sort of hugs the spine of the Occoquan Reservoir. One of the things I really appreciate about the district is the history we have there. So we have the Occoquan Native American tribe, which is named after that. It'd been there long before the colonists sort of settled there. But it's also the home of a very prominent African-American family that built their wealth after the Civil War. They're called the Chin family. We even have a library named after it. And to me, that's really important because I'm actually the direct descendant of Virginian slaves. So it just goes to the history that we have in that area. That's incredible. Now, tell us a little bit about the issues sure. uh, that you are prioritizing in your campaign and the issues that you'll champion once you're elected to supervisor. Sure. Thank you for that, Lindsay, because when we run for office, right, we want to make sure that our campaigns are about centering around the people we wish to serve. Right. And I've been out in the community for quite a few years now, knocking on doors, going to events, going to the people and asking them what they think we should be focusing on. So it's kitchen table issues, which shouldn't surprise anyone. We're talking about schools. Mm -hmm. You know, we have in Prince William County a very large school system, but unfortunately we have some of the largest class sizes in Northern Virginia, but some of the lowest teacher pay. Um, so we wanna help start to correct that imbalance there. Transportation. I don't think I have to tell anyone in Northern Virginia how much transport, transportation is an issue. Unfortunately, in Prince William County, we haven't done enough to invest in our transit system. So folks have to jump in their cars all the time to go to work, mm -hmm. to school. We have a little bit over 65% of people travel outside of our, our county to get to work and come back every day. And because we haven't invested in transit, people are stuck in traffic instead of spending time with their families. That, when I read that statistic, it was so telling. Over 65% of the residents in Prince William County, they travel outside of the right. county to work every day. Right. Wow, I mean that's a really staggering number when you when you think about the time away from families, time away from the dinner table, right. uh, those moments that really you know hold our communities together. Absolutely, and the last thing is is uh, services. So. We have a large veteran community in Prince William. We know we're sandwiched between Fort Belvoir up yes. north and Quantico down south. So we have a lot of folks that they serve our country, then they decide to retire and put down roots in our community. So veteran services, transportation issues, but also other folks outside of veterans that are struggling. You have homelessness, substance abuse, the opioid crisis, all these things we need to help people pick themselves back up when they fall on hard times. Well, and one of the things I've been so impressed with you when you talk about your priorities for the county, um, you have been so involved in the county for so many years, uh, whether it's your work as an activist through the NAACP. Can you talk about your experience, um, both professionally, um, but also in the community, and how that's prepared you to be a champion for people in your district? Sure, well, thank you for that. I actually work in insurance, which I know a lot of folks are going to think is a dirty word, but what I do professionally, we insure community associations, mm -hmm. so HOA boards, condo boards, things like that. We protect them from financial loss. We empower the board of directors to protect themselves from theft, from being sued by folks, even from hacking and, and, and you know computer theft. So mm -hmm. that's how what I do professionally. I travel all around the mid-Atlantic region helping insurance agents and those communities. In terms of my community involvement outside of that, you mentioned the NAACP. Yeah. I'm actually the former criminal justice chair for the Prince William NAACP. We've been working with the local law enforcement, with state legislators to help make our criminal system more fair and more just. And finally, 
just you know being someone who's willing to go out in the community learn from folks knocking on doors going to community events really taking the time to listen to people that have been in our community longer than I have or folks that haven't been nearly as long as I have you know I moved to the district a little bit over four years ago and we have such a broad brush of people from all walks of life you mentioned 65 percent of the people go outside the district well one in four people in my district are from another country. They're foreign born. We have so wow, many immigrants. That's, that's just a wild and broad breadth of people. That's great. I didn't realize that. That's incredible. You know, it's, it's amazing because you have been really pounding the pavement for years. And you do, you find out so much about the challenges that people face by knocking on their doors right. and really getting to know them and, and caring about what struggles they are, are facing. How will you take that same level of commitment and engagement to office? How sure. will you engage with your constituents and to ensure that they're a part of your policy making? Sure, I, I think that's a very sort of poignant question because far too often we've seen folks run for office, they spend a lot of time to earn those votes, mm -hmm. then when they take office, people don't really see them as much as right. they did before. They lose that connection here and there. Part of that is part of the job, you know, they're spending more time, you know, working through policies, meeting with agencies all throughout the state. But one of the things that I want to do is I want to keep that connection. Really, really stay in that community that helped get me elected and who I actually am seeking to serve. So I take a holistic, all the above approach, whether that's social media. I'm pretty, uh, uh, I have a really big presence on Facebook, you for do, example. Yes. I want to keep that engagement. I have uh, Twitter, Instagram. I want to reach people where they are, whether that's online or offline. You know, it's been said several times, I knock on a lot of doors. That will not stop just because I get in office. And our term limits, are, our terms are four years long, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you only see me in that election year. I want to just go door to door, asking people what they care about, what's going on, whether we have town halls, whether we have a legislator or a state agency coming down to have a town hall with us. I want to go out to people and tell them, hey, this is what's going on. This is what we should be doing. And right before budget season, mm -hmm. I want to have that holistic conversation. What are our values? What are our priorities as a community? And bring people in from the community and go to where they are and ask them, what should we be putting our, our t time, our talent, our treasure into when we're having these budget decisions? You raised the budget and that is gonna be obviously one of the most monumental things that you do, right, right. as a supervisor. It, it right. sets the tone, if you will, uh, for the county. Uh, tell me about the current budget. Is it? Do you believe that it accurately reflects the priorities or the challenges rather the county has? And, and if not, what will you do to change that? Sure, so in a word, no. I don't think <laughs> it currently reflects our values and our priorities because mm -hmm. one example we sort of talked about a little bit is education. Mm -hmm. um, we had obviously the Great Recession about 10 years ago and our current leadership we, they became very austere with our budget. Mm -hmm. they, they cut a lot of spending back. They cut a lot of the resources out of our school system, out of our, our social services. A lot of things that folks use to equalize a playing field from where right. they come from and where they want to be. Um, and since the, the recession was over, we still never really put that funding back. And it's been 10 years, so we finally, just this year, finally gave teachers a real pay raise on top of what they're making, a 4.8% pay raise. But a lot of that money came from the state. It didn't come from our local county board. Mm -hmm. So that goes to show sort of the disconnect in priorities. Our state delegates who have been doing an awesome job mm -hmm. for the past two years have prioritized that. Our school board chair, Dr. Latif, he just got elected this past year. He prioritized that. But we have a disconnect with our county board who has the real purse strings behind this. They're not really doing that. So I wanna to take to that board and say, we need to reinvest mm -hmm. in our school system, in our people, in our future, which is literally our students, and move from there. That's great, that's great. Now, we, like I said before, we have viewers from all over sure. Virginia. Um, you know, we might be touching people tonight that aren't in your district. Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about why this race is important, not only to Prince William County, but talk about why this race is important to the entire Commonwealth. Sure. So that's an awesome question, Lindsay. Thank you for asking that because people start thinking about local government only affecting the, uh, affecting the people in their district. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, a study was done about a year and a half ago by the New York Times, LA Times about the worst traffic corridors in the country. Mm -hmm. I come from LA, so people would assume that it's LA, Chicago, sure. and New York City. The worst traffic corridor in the nation is the 95 corridor between mm -hmm. uh, about you know uh, Lorton 
and Fredericksburg. Right. And that runs straight through the Occoquan districts. Mm -hmm. So decisions that we're making in transportation and transit funding affect not only C Prince William, not only Northern Virginia, but the entire nation. So people should be caring about what we do in Prince William through that corridor right there. But to bring it all home to what we really care about. Mm -hmm. We got a bad rep in Prince William County because we're known for Corey Stewart, who for a long time has set us back in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize the very first seat that Corey Stewart ever held elected office in is the Occoquan District Supervisor wow. seat. A lot of things that he's done to set us back started in that seat. So it started in Occoquan, and this year, Lindsay, we have an opportunity to end that in Occoquan, too. That's fantastic. You made an incredible point. I, you know, yes, when it comes to transportation, everyone should be focused on this district. Right. I mean, you hear all the time about what a tough commute that is or, right. or what a tough travel that is. Uh, on weekends for soccer tournaments and vacations. Um, so you made an incredible point there. And, and two, uh, the larger picture, so much is at stake uh, in this election. And uh, you know, one of the things I wanted you to touch on a little bit, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. is talking more about the importance of your involvement sure. and your service. I mean, to me, you reflect such a heart of service. How will that level of service be brought to that position. Sure, so to backtrack a little bit to why I'm doing this, mm -hmm. three years ago I lost my mom to chronic homelessness and substance abuse. And it made me realize that we don't have enough people with that kind of experience and that devotion of service mm -hmm. making decisions from the county level all the way up to you know state and federal offices. And so I considered myself making a promise to the legacy of my mother to serve others like she did. She was a nurse. Mm -hmm. And I devote every waking moment I can to serving folks in our community, outside of community, making sure that when I look back at my last days, I'm able to say I was able to help people and actually really make a positive impact on people's lives. So whether that's you know my involvement in the NAACP or being elected office, hopefully, or you know just advocating for things like health care, mm -hmm. criminal justice reform, combating homelessness, having that impact that average everyday people will be able to feel it in a very impactful way in their mm -hmm. lives. And that's where I think about every time I get up every morning. That's incredible and you can see it. You can see your heart of service. So thank you for putting your name on the ballot. Thank you, thank you for having the courage to run. Absolutely. And for viewers inside your district and outside your district, tell us a little bit about where people can go to find out more about you, your social and also your website. Sure, so my website is Kenny for Supervisor, for spelled out F-O-R, supervisor.com. I'm also all over social media like we talked about. It's Kenny Bode, K-E-N-N-Y-B-O-D-D-Y-E. And you can come out, go to our website, donate if you'd like, come out and knock doors for us. It's a short drive, make phone calls, what have you. Great, well to learn more about Kenny, please go to his website. Thank you for being with us tonight.